episode. I'm super excited to have Ashley Ronnie Single U with us today. She's a certified parenting coach, international best selling author, and founder of Raising Humanity. She discovered through her own life process, deep healing, and by way of her own children, just how important it is to take responsibility for ourselves and reclaim joy freedom, and aliveness we were all born with. I love that. Raising Humanity is a community-based organization that helps families recreate their foundation of beliefs based on their own values so that they can walk their most authentic path. I freaking love this. Like, thank you for being here. And I can't wait to dive in and get some advice for parents, but also just like all of us to reclaim our joy and really step into our own authenticity in a deeper way. So I just want to like dive right in. How did you, you know, step into this path? Tell us a little bit about your story. Yeah. So my story, like many, is full of a lot of pivots and detours from love, as I like to call them. And for me, I was stopped in my tracks, not with the first child, but with the second child. I mean, prior to that, I was in corporate and climbing that success ladder and then came into real estate um, with the familiarity of my family being in that industry. And as much as I loved all of that, I recognized that my bandwidth really shifted in welcoming the children into my life. Mm-hmm. and. You know, I was quite triggered then because I had seen um, myself as a successful businesswoman. I was highly identified by what I did in the outside world and how happy I kept my clients and how how much I was for everyone around me. You know that template. Mm -hmm. And when the children came, I recognized that it was not only a journey of raising them, but it was also initiating me into a journey of raising myself, especially in the ways that I had not contacted, you know, through the go, 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 let's continue on life's treadmill and create and, you know, do and do and do. And there's so many distractions, as you know, in our adult world. I mean, if it's not the phone, it's a friend. If it's not the friend, it's food. If it's not food, it's sex. You know, we have access to so many distractions. And what I recognized in those moments with my second child There was one time I remember, and I was quickly putting together some oatmeal and serving it over the counter. And I just remember that they were completely glazed over. Mm. And the way it looked to me was that there was no life left in them anymore. Wow. And as a young mother, having two children under two years old at that time, that was a recognition. That was the, you know, the signal I needed that life was not meant to continue in this way anymore. Mm. Yet, because I was so deeply identified with everything that I did and was, it took me a lot of years thereafter just to sit with um, the anger that was coming up, the disbelief in um, how I had been leading my life and not paying attention to the child within me and also the recognition that these children were um, here for a lot more than I assumed. You know, I couldn't just fit them into a box and carry on with my life. And I think in the modern day world, we tend to do this so well, you know, compartmentalize and say, well, children sit over here and they go to school while we go to work and then we come home. And by the time we come home, we're typically deeply exhausted. And this is the way that I continue to show up for my children. And I asked myself in, you know, years of being in my own deep wells, is this how I want to be with those who I say I care about more than anybody else in the world? Is this how I want to live in my most intimate relationships? You know, do I want to feed them the leftovers, which is what they were getting, you know, day and night from me? And um, it brought me into a really vulnerable place. And yet, despite all the, you know, I'd had a lot of um, exposure to spirituality through my Hindu roots, and then my mother had gotten into personal development and all that sort of stuff when she came to Canada, not feeling that she knew herself in this environment. So I was exposed to that throughout my life. And then it started to really accelerate once the children came in because I had no anchors. I was like, where do I go that feels familiar for me? And I went through, you know, I went 
through a lot of healing and coaching and transformation. I even signed up for transpersonal therapy school, which lasted a year before it was like, no, you're meant to be at home with your kids and not doing these things and not trying to create more and not trying to be out in the world more. And no matter how much I did, I still felt this deep pain of not being enough for the world mm. and feeling that, you know, now as I look back at it, what it felt like was a feeling that I was not good enough to be their mother. I was not good enough for God. I was not good enough for, you know, the world around me, really. And this deep state of inadequacy led me to, um, yeah, ideations that I never thought I would arrive to. And yes, that led me up a mountain one fine day, believing that I was just there for a run or a hike. And this was on Bowen Island. And I ended up um, in a situation that led me to a near death experience. So I was without food and water and company. And it's one of those mountains where they say, take a compass or take company, if not both. And I didn't listen to any of that. I think I was just, I was really at my end. And I was at that, you know, at that fork in the road where I had to decide whether I was going to choose to be here or not. And that near death experience really shifted the definition of, um, what I thought this life was all about and what love was. I actually recognized through that experience and all the months of integration thereafter and years of integration that still continue that love has so many different faces, mm -hmm. you know, and that I too had a chance to be so many different colors and so many different aspects of humanity and no part of it was wrong. So when I agreed to come back down, I was led, um, but I sat with myself for many months thereafter as I was myself being reborn and understanding the world through a new lens. And the vision of raising humanity came in about um, six or seven months after that. So it was quite beautiful how it came in. It was a vision of so many of us at the helm of the ship. And no longer were we in this paradigm of overexerting you know, self-responsibility right. or doing it all on our own mm -hmm. or trying to raise children in isolation in our nuclear family units. There was an entirely different model for the future in front of me. So that's how this all began. That's, a, that's quite the story. And what I love about your story is that you're being vulnerable, you're open with it, and also identifying the ways that so many of us are categorizing different parts of our life, numbing parts of ourselves like, oh, this is okay, this isn't okay. And also um, the choice to be here. And then the unworthiness, like, am I worthy of this? And, and I I really love your story because I think so many people can relate, whether it's um, in parenting, um, running a business, putting themselves out there in love, like it's so relevant right now. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you see as far as like this authentic path for parenting, because a lot has changed for you since. And so what's, what's different? What does this look like? Um, tell us more about that. Yeah, so one of the big things, and I'll take a step outside of the box to share this piece, but my core recognition was that as long as I was trying to adjust myself within a nuclear family unit in which one or two or more children are relying on one or two parents, and perhaps a grandmother who comes over occasionally, we will not be able to offer the children the ability to be seen, to be heard, and to be known most importantly, mm -hmm. as they're meant to be. I mean, we look at the child um, going into class, you know, the classroom setting, and they're getting 1 20th or 1 30th of the teacher's time, if that during a day, mm -hmm. during the day. And that to me was really striking when I started to understand how um, unresourced and under-resourced not only parents were, but the child care providers that we rely on. Mm -hmm. And when we look back at our history of 
you know, 400,000 years of existing as a human species, we've always had 10 to 12 adults raising any given child. Mm. And in just two generations, we've come so far away from that. And not to romanticize the past, but also to acknowledge that what we're doing is trying to meet the impossible. We're trying to keep ourselves afloat while trying to keep our children afloat. And what we're also seeing is this deep segregation in society where we have so many people without children who are now off doing their thing, which is wonderful. I think that path of coming into self and knowing self and taking the space is so important at this time. It's what's been needed through our Western paradigm. Yet, we can also understand the separation we have from our own inner child as a result of how society is set up. I mean, most adults will go days, if not weeks, without ever contacting a young child. Mm. And that speaks to, from my lens, the amount of fear we hold of our own innocence, our true freedom, our creativity, our playfulness, our own messiness. What we are really doing is saying, well, you sit over here because you are a threat for most of us in this mechanical society. Mm. So that's a lot. And I'm just going to put that out there because... Um, <laughs> I love the way you said that. that's a lot. I mean, that's <laughs> so good, like so true, right? And we don't like to often look at the frameworks that we're in. We'd rather just piecemeal solutions together. So we'll give the parent a conscious parenting book and say, fix yourself and take more responsibility and just be better. But the reality is this is a systemic issue mm -hmm. and I'm not one to blame the systems, but I am one to be in that realization that without the mother actually having space for herself, without others coming into her home and, you know, co-regulating the nervous system, which is what we are meant to do. I mean, Dr. Dan Siegel talks about the brain being a social animal. We are meant to do this together. And I think this path of personal development that I've seen all my life in the Western paradigm, it eventually becomes a path of diminishing returns mm -hmm. as people become overly obsessed and they start becoming overly identified with that persona that they're building in this, you know, path on this path of self-inquiry or spirituality or however they identify it again as being separate. Mm -hmm. Like at every moment, that's a part of us. And if we recognize that children are actually indeed the greatest representation of our spiritual or truthful or honest nature, we would reintegrate them into society and we would take a chance on learning from them and being with them. This is such a, a powerful conversation. Like, because this is, this is access to play. This is access to messiness. This is access to feeling our emotions. This is access to, well, I'm even going to throw up being dramatic if you need to be dramatic. Like children fully allow themselves to feel and experience and express themselves and lead with curiosity. And one of the things I've personally been working on in my life is allowing myself to be in my spirit a lot more and play because that's the truest essence of who I am is play, it's joy, it's fully expressed. And I feel like in the world that we live in, that I've been observing a lot lately, especially like North America, the spirit has been, you know, squashed or put in a box and, you know, the soul, the spirit, the higher self, all those things have different energies about them. The spirit wants to play. It wants to be expressive. It doesn't want to be judged. And, and so I love that we're having this conversation around that. And it's so interesting. Something just came up for me, like personally, I felt it in my chest. And I think that this is potentially something that could serve a lot of people who are listening right now. It's I'm excited to have children. I can't wait to have children. And I'm terrified because of everything that you're saying about the world that we live in and how everything's been set up. It's so much on the mother and it's, it's really about changing your identity in a lot of ways. And so what I'm really feeling from this, is like loosening the grip of what that looks like and having more flow and fluidity and not losing yourself so that you can really serve and have a deeper relationship with your children and yourself because yourself if you don't have a good relationship with yourself you're not going to be able to really connect with others in a deep way so thank you for sharing this i'm like yes 
<laughs> tell tell us about the future of parenting and, and what you see and, and what you're creating right now. Yeah, I love that. And I really want to celebrate and honor you because to bring that piece of joy out in our day-to-day -day lives or through what we do is really vulnerable. It's vulnerable to be excited. It's vulnerable to be alive. You know, it's vulnerable to be seen in that part of our sort of, you know, shared ecosystem and uh, humanity. So I really want to acknowledge that because I find in the joy, we can find ourselves sort of dropping into the the wells, right? The the natural lows of life. And I find that children so beautifully embrace, as you mentioned, the natural emotional progression of taking that information in and saying, okay, I'm going to feel this. I'm going to let it run through me. And then it's just done. Mm -hmm. And then they put it aside and they move on to the next. Mm -hmm. And I find so often there's a game in the personal development world of changing your state. Let's just change the state. And we become so addicted to changing the moment from what it actually is meant to be and the information it's it. meant to give us. What's that? Avoidance tactic. It's like, oh, just change your state. Just avoid what's uncomfortable. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to cold plunge or I'm going to go and do this. <laughs> right. And then we wonder why we're on the spiritual treadmill for a lifetime because we're not actually getting the message that we're meant to in that eruption or however it shows up. So the future for me really looks like a future of play. Like my little guy was actually the catalyst in this life as he saw me mired to my cell phone, you know, hanging out through the late night hours in the blue light. And as I remember breastfeeding him and feeling into how can I make my days more effective? Um, how can I manage to get more done? Like it was that whole identity of this is the only lifetime in which I have to resolve my souls, you know? Um, big questions. How limited we become in our thinking when we believe that this is the only lifetime we are here for. And I really honor those that don't believe in reincarnation. And at the same time, I invite you, just as you've mentioned, to recognize that we are all living with the presence of a soul. I mean, we are not just here as the material aspect of ourselves. And when we really tune into that, we step off of this um, treadmill, what I call, you know, the fight against our own mortality. And we start to sit back more and come into the energy of the mother, which is one of deep trust, which is one of slowing down, which is one of inherent connection to all things, all places, all people, all ways even. So that's how I see the future is all of humanity continuing to practice the pause. And that's the first pillar of our authentic parenting paradigm is the personal responsibility to say, wait, this life is actually not serving the essence that I can feel boiling within me. You know, and then we move into intuition and then we move into back into community. But the way I see it is that we're moving back towards a community-based healing structure where healing just comes about organically. You know, no longer are we putting it into sort of this, um, this place and space for elites to dive into because they have the space and time to do so. Mm -hmm. You know, thousands of dollars of programs. I mean, that can be valuable. And I think it served us as being valuable up until now. And even our own programs we were asked to pause on. These were amazing holistic programs that did wonders. Yet we were guided so strongly to break that model down and put it into a model that was more accessible. So for me, that's the way of the future is creating something that's accessible for all. Mm -hmm. And learning across cultures and learning across borders and learning through people who have walked different paths of lives. That's because really for awesome. me, yeah, I, I find that there's so much wisdom in the land. And when we come to a place like North America, I mean, I felt it throughout my childhood, being between here and, you know, regular visits to India, where we are disconnected from the land, we are not actually accessing the wisdom of, you know, all of those who have walked before us. And I find that to be a critical piece of 
knowledge now that needs to come forth. And so many of our Indigenous have been holding that, not only in North America, but all around the world. So for that wisdom to now merge between the East and the West, or the new and the old, I feel is the way of the future. Mm. So what it looks like for us is it's called the playground of life, speaking to play. And it's really a natural portal to learning in community, freely with full expression and doing it in your own way so that it meets your own authentic style. Mm, that's so beautiful. And what I really, what, what's really coming forward for me is the land piece. And because the land, I'm really tuned into the, the land as well, like the energetics of different land. And I feel that our, our land has been traumatized because we have not been building a relationship with the land that we live on. We've just been, you know, we're going to bulldoze this. We're going to change that, like, like the physical land of what we're doing. And, and um, if we can really tune more into nature, well, nature is within us. And if we're in nature more, we naturally go into that rhythm. And the really interesting thing that I've observed while I've been traveling, and I love that you have, you've been in India and then also Canada because it's very different, is um, when I was spending quite some time in Mexico, but also different places that I've traveled, it's, there was such a beautiful energy of just village mentality. So perfect example, I would go out for live music all the time and there's just live music, everyone, everyone's like in their spirits, <laughs> in along, doing whatever in the streets. And it's just so fun. Like, oh, I'm going to dance every night. I'm going to sing every night or whatever. I'm going to dress up all the time. And there was these people that I met, these artists, and I just got into playing the guitar. I see you have a guitar behind there too and singing and and I was speaking to the artists after and they're like, hey, you, you sing and you, you play guitar. I'm like, oh, kind of like, I kind of play the guitar. I'm a little, I'm like, I know like a few strings, but like, you know, and I'm like, I'm doing singing lessons. I want to perform. They're like, hey, anytime you want to practice or jam or anything, you can come on over to our, our studio and play with us. And they weren't trying to pick me up or anything yeah. like that. It was just very like authentic, hey, we're, we'd love to support you and everywhere I went in this community that I was in, everyone was like that. And I was like, I feel more loved. And this is kind of a vulnerable thing to say is like, I feel like more loved and accepted and, and, and invited in a community I'm new to than some of the communities I've lived for a long time. And I was like, wow, like we're so like, I say we as, you know, collectively, what I'm seeing is we're so guarded and, mm. and there's so, we have so much going on in our mind and in our life that we're not really in that space of free flowing and we have so many rules and, and I was just, it was just such a beautiful experience and then all of these awarenesses and healings that I had when I was there that I didn't even know that I had to move through, they just happened effortlessly and mm. I think it was because of that balance of play and fluidity and village mentality everyone is taking care of everyone and I was just I felt like I was in the family do you know yeah. what I'm saying and it was I love that it's like exactly what you're talking about right and yeah. I was like, this is so special <laughs> <laughs> I love that you just had that experience though because sometimes it takes being in that experience to recognize the value of it more often than not I'd say and I grew up in a family of 12 so I had three mothers and three fathers essentially i had my mother and then i had my uncles and i had my father and then i had my sorry other way around mothers and aunts and fathers and uncles so the 12 of us you know adults and children we lived under one roof and that was something even in our generation it wasn't seen so much in canada but my father carried that model of joint family living over from india because we couldn't afford to live in separate homes that was part of it but i think innately when you're rooted in a sense of community while acknowledging the enmeshment piece which can also limit growth tremendously um we can come into a really beautiful balance of finding our individual essence within the collective support system mm -hmm. so when we talk about mothers from our lens we don't just mean mothers that are birth children we're talking about community community builders like you we're talking about um, stewards of the land we're talking about people not gender specific but those who are really here to nurture their creative projects mm -hmm. those that you know are caring for others in their neighborhoods maybe it's the elderly maybe it's the child that they can go and 
just knock on the door of the home of and say, hey, would you like to play today? You know, those grown up friends that children are longing for. So when we talk about the mother, it's really the motherly energy that's now being invited back onto our earth. And I've been seeing the motherly energy travel from Asia and Africa, where it's been so deeply embedded in the land. And I've been seeing her travel over the years. Mm -hmm. And for me, it just feels like such a magnificent time. And now that she's starting to land in our bodies, what's not possible? Mm -hmm. Like we can create beautiful communities in these highly resourced places like North America mm -hmm. and do it from a place of pure intention. Mm -hmm. And intention is the foundation of creation, right? And that's another thing. It's like being intentional with, you know, how do I want to feel today? What do I want to create? Because that is about taking responsibility. When I think about it, it's like, well, what's your intention? What's the energy that you're bringing? And what are you creating? And I think that that's a really powerful question to ask yourself on a daily basis. And also what I'm noticing as well is there's this idea you were talking about joint living with family and all of that and community. And, and I think that's really beautiful. I find that more in North America, we're about independence. We're about being independent and being strong. And I know I've definitely have constructs of my being that I've moved through and I'm working through probably always. It's like, oh, like I'm trying to be an individual. Like, why? Why is that more valuable? Or where did that programming come from? Mm -hmm. And I think that as you're having this conversation, I'm I'm feeling into a lot of this because of, you know, if you are resisting any of these concepts, the question is, well, where did the belief system come from? Where were you taught it wasn't safe to be, to feel, to, you know, whatever it is. And is that serving you? Because community is love. And so as you were going back to your original, earlier when you were speaking about your story, you were talking about worthiness. Like you were in that space um, as a mother of two young children and like not feeling good enough, not feeling worthy enough of like um, really feeling the way that you wanted to feel in God and, and all of that. And I think this is a really good space to hone in on for a second, because when you ask yourself the questions when you take the time to feel and use your intuition, you know, is this how I want to feel? No. Well, what's going on here? What's the story? Where did this come from? How do I want to feel instead? And then from how do I want to feel instead? Who do I need to surround myself with? What environments do I need to get into? Which all comes back to community. So I just love this conversation. It's so oh, like, my. yes, <laughs> I'm like, yes, sister. Yes. <laughs> Lovely. Well, I'm so glad that you're able to, to see a bridge as well. What I sense with you is that you're willing to walk on that bridge that's literally being created under our feet. And I think that's part of the paradigm that's coming in right now is can we step into the unknown together? I mean, that's our work at Raising Humanity in the Playground is can we move before we know? Mm hmm and I think that's what we're being called to because especially again in North America where we've been cut off from the motherly wisdom as a result of us, you know, placing the indigenous wisdom in its little compartment. Um, many women here have stepped into the patriarchal shoes, you know, so they're feeding that same engine that we've spent a long time blaming men for. Mm -hmm. They're doing that very thing. And as you've shared now, we're returning back to, hey, can this look different? Can we know self and do things outside of the home and not be over identified with our role? Because that's not at all the trajectory that at least we advocate for mm -hmm. and not have that come from this energy of needing to belong or forcing ourselves to belong or paying to belong, which is a big one when we look at our North American community models. Mm -hmm. Almost everywhere that we belong, we pay. Right. There's a price of entry. Mm -hmm. And that's something really worth acknowledging is that most Indigenous communities have no entry fee. Mm -hmm. But here, if it's not, you know, the cost of coaching, if it's not the cost of private schools, if it's not, you know, that mother group who goes out and drinks the wine and can pay the bill at the end of the night, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. typically we find ourselves not, you know, mm -hmm. belonging naturally right. and easily. It's really forced. 
Wow. This, this, this conversation could so, go so deep and we could probably go on for hours of all of the different ways that this is showing up and um, how it shows up in the human, how, how, as we as humans show up with all of these pieces, paying to be good enough, working hard enough to be good enough, you know, being independent, being strong, being this, being that. And it's, um, it's really causing a lot of harm and uh, self betrayal um, mm -hmm. and disease in the world because when we have disease, I believe it's our soul giving us a message. And oftentimes we are not listening to the message because we are boxing ourselves in. So I love this conversation about the unboxing process. <laughs> As we wrap up today, is there anything else that you'd like to share with um, our listeners today, last message or, or anything else? Yeah, what comes up for me is a deep reverence and commitment to the responsibility and gifted it, it is to really pay attention to what we are leaving here on the planet as we go. You know, and somebody else comes in and Holt carries the torch and takes a turn. Are we really paying attention to that? I find so often our lens goes to 30 or 40 or 50 years and then it sort of stops. Mm -hmm. And again, of course, being in our own pure intention and getting radically aligned, as you, you so beautifully share with our current message is naturally depositing seeds of greatness into future generations there's no doubt about that mm -hmm. but are we really taking a look at the structures in which we exist in mm -hmm. or are we just painting the picture pretty to sort of make do for the next few decades right and i really invite all of you who are listening to really sit with that and ask what structures are you still contributing to and what are the energies of this these structures whether it's you know the western personal development world whether it's education for your children um, based on you know the need to do xyz so that they can eventually belong and pay the bills to get the house to get the kid to get married you know just to keep on this treadmill mm -hmm. what are the structures that you are buying into systemically mm -hmm. so for me it's not so much anymore about just fixing the moment and being our best it's really taking a radical leap mm -hmm. into doing something that will really test your ability to stay stay in a vision until humanity can catch up with you and that's what we offer as an organization is are you willing to go that far out and anchor in the knowing that you have in all of your bodies that we can't leave anybody behind in this process i mean if we do it <laughs> you know we will all be burned as we cross this bridge and i think it's really important for us to widen our lens and really speak to what's wanting to come through as opposed to sugarcoating it and saying well it's fine i'll distract myself for a little bit more and make do mm -hmm. We're at the end, and that was really a clear message when I was, you know, at my own threshold in my near-death experience. The world was shown to me 50 years from that moment, which was four years ago, and it was bleak, and it was dead, and there was no life on this planet. And even if us humans are, <laughs> you know, believe that we can keep going, I really challenge us to understand how it is that we want to keep going and the place from which we're creating because future generations are relying on all of us and that's not only those of us who have children. So it's really important that we start all taking a responsibility in um, those that are yet to come. Beautiful. Thank you so much for this conversation. I think it's, um, it's the big picture and this needs to happen. And, and that's why I love having people like you on the show to talk about planetary change alignment. This is all about being in alignment, right? Living in alignment. What do you want to create and taking that responsibility and, 
I really love the piece around taking a step, even if you don't know, but trusting in your intuition. And it sounds like that's quite a message here is trusting, listening to your intuition, not distracting and sugarcoating. It's easy to avoid, distract, do the quick fix, but long-term there's a cost. There's a cost so much bigger than, than the cost of just showing up and doing the difficult thing in the now. That's how we access flow. That's how we go into the path of least resistance, which is living in your gifts, um, making the impact that you're here to make. So thank you so much for being here. I will put your personal information for Ashley below if anyone wants to get more in tune with what she's creating and up to. Make sure to click the links below. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your message today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun, <laughs> to oh, say the least. Yeah. <laughs>